Hello. We're back. We're back. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I ask you to bless, bless our um, time here today. I ask you to guide us to this time. And I ask you to touch people's hearts, to make comments if they need to, or anything like that. Father, we ask you to bring up the questions and, and the answers. And we thank you for that. I ask you to, to be with those out there who are ill, who um, are watching and being a part of this video. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. We're back in uh, James. Been working on on my text for Romans. It's so very good. So we are in James in chapter five. He's closing out his his um, letter. Hey Gary, it's good to see you. He's closing out his letter. Can you hear me, okay, Gary? And uh, and he's giving his closing comments right now. Um, he said he had talked about in the last in our last session. He had talked in ten. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Then in verse eleven he says, "Indeed, we count them blessed." Who, who endure. We count those who endure to be blessed. And what we remember the word uh, blessed means happy, fortunate, or fully satisfied. There's something satisfying about sticking it out. And he says, you've heard of the perseverance of Job, and you've seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And we saw that last time very compassionate and merciful. And how, here now in verse 12, he says this, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. So so these are, this is what he says. As James writes these sentences, he most likely had something in mind that Jesus said. And I'm going to quote it out of Matthew 5, verse 34 to 37. Hey, Donna, thanks for letting me know you're here. If anybody comes in, please tell me that you're here so I'll know. I want to acknowledge you. So he's quoting. He says, when he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verse 34 through 37. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. James is challenging another self-protective action many people in his culture took as a normal part of their lives. Remember, flesh always has to do with either protecting ourselves or providing for ourselves. And it always brings death, even though we think it's going to bring life. Let me turn this down a little bit. There. It always brings death, even though we think it's going to bring life or protect our lives. And so I, I, I did some research, as I do, and I found a, a fascinating uh, comment on this in the Life Application New Testament Commentaries, one of the commentaries that I um, tap on a regular basis. I think it's really good. He says this, Jesus, James is referring to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 34, 34 to 37. Taking oaths was a common practice 
and James wanted it discontinued among the believers. People made disrespectful or arrogant verbal guarantees that they themselves could reverse by legal technicalities. Like bold-faced warranties with loads of fine print, these oaths were intended to create an impression of truth. But those who uttered them did not really expect to be held to them, to what they say. Christians should never need to take an oath in order to guarantee the truth of what they say. Our honesty should be unquestionable. Believers should not need oaths, for their speech should always be truthful. There should be no reason for them to have to strengthen a statement with an oath God will judge our words. That's from the Life Application New Testament commentary. Having said that, it's astounding to me how many Christians do not live like this. How many Christians, well, basically, if you've experienced them long enough, you know you can't really trust their words. Uh, some, sometimes there are people that are talking to me and I don't even pay attention to what they're saying because I know none of it's going to be true or it doesn't matter or they'll swap their stories. They'll tell you, I made a commitment to do this and then, then they, you know, they're doing it next time you see them. So it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> At the end of James 5.12, it's this statement. And I'm going to quote it here for us. So that if you see the Bible study, you can see it as a comment. Remember to say if you're here uh, when you come in. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. You know, evangelism doesn't just have to do with knocking on doors and putting pamphlets about Jesus under someone's windshield wiper. It's not just about street preaching either. Although those are all good. They're fine. I was just talking to a young guy and I said, you know, walking, we are walking, talking billboards of Jesus. And either we're going to give a good impersonation or a good presentation, not, not impersonation, a good presentation of who Jesus is through how we live or we're not. Our lives are evangelism. How we conduct our lives either draws people to Christ in us or repels them from him in us. Um, that's just the way it is. It has an effect on the people around us. We will either live honestly or we're going to live in such a way that we repel people. When our yeses turn out to really be no's, or you can't trust me. When our no's turn out to be yeses, or you can't trust me, we lose the basis for anyone trusting us because we're not trustworthy. Why would anyone care about our God if we do not represent him any better than that? I would rather a person say nothing about an intention than for them to state an intention that they have really no intention to ever fulfill. So we'll either, we'll either live honestly or we're going to live in such a way that repels people. Do you think Jesus had a problem always sticking to the truth? Of course not. He had no problem doing that at all. He had the Holy Spirit of truth. And, and uh, the verses for that, just in case... You want to look it up? Jesus had the Holy Spirit of truth living inside his human spirit. And these are the three verses that tell us this. So why do we think some Christians have trouble telling the truth consistently? Christians have that very same Holy Spirit in their human spirits. We have the Holy Spirit of God, the same Holy Spirit of truth that Jesus had in him, we have inside of us. So why do some of us lie so much? 
I mean, it's an uncomfortable question. Hey, hey, Liz, it's good to see you. I hope you feel better. Um, it's a good question. It's an uncomfortable question, but I think it's a good question. Why, if every Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling inside, do so many of us have trouble telling the truth? Well, the first thing to say about that is really uncomfortable, but it's true. For one thing, not everyone who comes to our meetings has actually and truly given their lives to Jesus and have received him as Lord. There's a lot of people showing up at church and at house church and at uh, conferences and seminars and men's breakfasts and women's breakfasts and ladies' convocations and all those things, but they never really gave themselves to the Lord. There's a lot of people that believe because they were raised going to church that they're saved. But the scripture never teaches that. The scripture teaches that we must ask Jesus to be our Lord, profess him as our Lord, proclaim him as our Lord, and receive him as our Lord, and repent of our sins, and we will be saved. That's right. Many people bearing the title of Christian don't belong to him at all. And therefore, don't have the Holy Spirit guiding them from within. So what spirit is guiding them? The unholy spirit, Satan, and his demons, is often controlling people and telling people how to live, and he's the prince of lies. Then there are Christians who have not yet surrendered their strongholds to the Lord. And if one stronghold is deception, he won't always look like Jesus in terms of honesty. Now, God is patient, and he'll address those things in his timing. Hence, we have verses like this one in James. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Let me see something. But let your yes be yes and your no's be no. One thing we can do when we know that there's a problem, like if we find ourselves being untruthful, it's not the end of everything. One thing we can do is admit that we need changing and ask the Lord to help. One thing we can do if we procrastinate all the time. One thing we can do if we never finish what we start. One thing we can do if we make promises that we can't keep is to uh, admit that we need changing and ask the Lord to help. There's a beautiful statement in Psalm 19, verses 12 and 14 through 14, and it says this. Who can understand his errors? How many of us get stuck at asking God to heal us of a problem or take away a problem because we don't understand why we do it? Some of the more detail-oriented people be that way. As soon as I figure out why I do this, I'm going to go to the Lord with it. Why wait? I mean, I just don't think I'm going to be able to wrap around, wrap my head around all the dumb stuff I come up with sometimes. Who can understand his errors, the psalmist writes. Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant, that's himself, also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Let not presumptuous sins have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth, which is a beautiful prayer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your heart, in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Isn't that beautiful? Hey, Mary and Galley, yes, we can. We will do that um, when we're done. Thank you. I hope you stayed through the whole study. Marion is the wife. I've never met her, 
and the widow of my friend Mark Galley, who I met when I was working on my, we were working on our bachelor's in geography. He's just a sweet guy. And I wish I'd kept up with him all these years. But it's so, I did keep up with him on Facebook until his death. So um, we can do that and we'll pray. Um, and, and Marion, if you want, I can send this to my prayer team. It has people that pray all around, actually all around the world, New Zealand and Germany and all over the South America and all over Canada and all over the USA. And they send it on to others. Just say whether you want me to do that. I wouldn't put it out there on my prayer request unless you asked. I always try to be uh, sensitive about that. Listen to what he says in there. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Don't let my sins have dominion over me. Allow the words of my mouth to be good words that come out. Okay. I'll send that to myself as soon as this study's over. And then we'll pray at the end of the study today. Uh, thank you. Um, it's perfectly okay to give prayer requests in a Bible study. This is not an interruption. It's perfectly okay to ask questions or make comments. It's what it, I wish we could have like a, a chat room instead of like a lecture. I wish uh, Facebook had something like that to where we all, we could all freely speak. But um, this is what we have right now. Um, on the idea of when we admit we need cleansing or healing or something fixed in our souls, ask the Lord to hate us, to, to not to hate us, ask the Lord to cause us to hate deception in ourselves and they hate deception in the world. And I'll tell you, that will make you uncomfortable because the world's crawling with deception. Ask him to take it out of you and then go be truth to the world. When my kids, when my kids were growing up, um, and they, and, and I can think about that, but I'm not really good at Zoom. Um, I'll, let me think about it, Donna. That's a good idea. Um, when my kids were getting to be uh, the age that go work, I, I told them, always show up on time, stay longer than they need you there. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Do everything they say exactly the way they say it, and you'll do well. And the reason I said that is because most of the other people that were going to work there were going to be messing off, and they'd stick out. And in a world full of deception, if we go out into the world and be truth to the world, we're going to stand out. Sometimes that will bring derision. It will bring attack to us. But, but, um, but, but so what? I mean, if you look at all the, all the greats in the Bible, they all caught it for being truthful. And so let's just be truthful. It's better. And it's good for us. And it feels great to do it. As we come to the final eight lines of this letter, James is going to close it the way he started with an encouragement to pray, kind of like bookends to, to a letter. Why would he use prayer as bookends to his letter? Well, James knows that the stresses of earthly life can cause us to forget to look up to the Lord and turn to him. They captivate us sometimes. There are two passages which come to mind when I feel overwhelmed by life, really, by the world. I told the lady in a furniture store recently, believe it or not, I was in a furniture store ministering uh, when we were looking at furniture. I told her um, that God didn't, that God didn't build us to be looking down all the time. And I've taught this and probably every Bible study I've taught, and I might have taught it on here before, but you never know who's in here that's new. Sometimes people just come and sit and they don't say they're here. The earth itself, the, the world, the earth, not the world, but the earth, um, has a gravitational pull. When we put satellites in the earth, if they don't readjust 
the degrading orbit of that satellite, it'll crash hopefully in an Indian sea and not on somebody's house. But the, the globe has, has gravity and will slowly but surely pull, pull this satellite into itself and, and the world, which is a system in which we were born, into which we were born. And when Satan was cast down from heaven to the earth, he was cast down to the world and he began to build a system on that world and that system controls most people. And it too has a gravitational pull and it causes people to look down. It causes people to look at all the terrible stuff, wars and riots and shit, gunshots and disease and, and they're all real and they do affect us and we need to know about some of that but what it does is it causes us to be bummed out. When I'm when the stresses of earthly life do this, when it overwhelms me, I have two passages I turn to. The first reminds me that whatever is about to happen, whatever it is, whatever it is, it will eventually be to my advantage. Otherwise, the Lord wouldn't let it happen. He would shield me from it. And that's one of my first go-to verses for this. Paul speaking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 14, 16, 17, 18. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. See, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to be so obsessed with the things of the earth that we lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our art of man is perishing, our bodies are, are degrading and are aging, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day if we're born again. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. So, so this light affliction, which could feel like, you know, um, Bobby, uh, who is having liver cancer, which hurts, uh, and surgery hurts, that's going to pass. And if he passes through that, it will work for him a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why? While we look, do not look at the things which are seen, but that the things are not seen. Focusing on this God of ours who is invisible, but his works are not. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, God, are eternal. So that passage reminds me that whatever's fixing to come, that I know that eventually it's going to be for my benefit. The other passage reminds me that each of these overwhelming times, and that one spoke about it, but that each of these overwhelming times is temporary. It's not designed to be here forever. Yeah, that's what you get, Donna. Feelings of doom and gloom. Um, the other passage reminds me, the one I'm about to quote, that each of these is overwhelming times is temporary. In other words, they all pass by in time. I'll, I'll tell you something before I go on, Donna. You can command those messages to leave. And one of the things that I teach is that now we're not in control of what someone will try to put into our soul. But we are in control. We have the power, the authority to not let it get inside. We can block a really good teaching. We can block everything that Jesus said. We can just, we, we could hear it and not let it get into our souls, or we can receive it, right? We can receive forgiveness, or we can ignore forgiveness and block it. And by the same token, we can receive messages of gloom and gloom and allow them to just play havoc in our souls, or 
we can say, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm going to set my mind on the things above and not on the things below. I'm going to focus on something that's good. I personally enjoy watching people, and I personally like reading stuff that's not heavy. Because it's the antidote to this worldly junk, right? And this is what uh, Peter said that reminded me that each of these is temporary. He says, be sober. That doesn't mean don't be drunk. It means be serious. Be vigilant. And really, it's hard to be this kind of sober if you're not the other kind of sober, too. But be sober both ways. But be sober, be serious, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's just want to chew us up. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing, for one thing, that we're not alone. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And this is the part. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. After you have suffered a while. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. See, in the beginning of that passage in 1 Peter 5, 8, he talks about how Satan believes he can operate freely in this dominion and really make our souls, your soul and my soul, a part of his dominion by how he controls our thoughts and our emotions because we don't monitor what we let get in our soul. This is why I don't watch horror movies. This is why I don't like read horror books. This is why I don't go on, on uh, I don't like uh, uh, riding on, um, what's that, amusement park rides. I don't need to be made afraid. And I certainly don't need to pay somebody to scare me. I could drive in traffic in DFW and do that. Uh, but, um, I want, I want to control what comes in. I'm aware that there's bad stuff. I watch the news to some degree. I read stuff that I know isn't biased, or I think isn't biased. So I'm not living in a bubble. I'm just, I'm just. How much of it am I going to let, let get inside me? In the beginning, he says, "Be sober. Pay attention." Someone wants to make you his dominion, but resist him because you have the ability to resist the devil. Steadfast in the faith and be aware, be thinking that the same sufferings experienced by others and that are born again. He says, but after you suffer a little while, God has a game plan. That after we go through a period of hurt and a period of discomfort, in which God accomplishes something inside of us. <coughs> Excuse me. He perfects us. I need a sip of water. Hey, Joe. Welcome. Um, after we suffered a while, I've looked that word up. It means a season. You know what's cool about seasons? They have a beginning and an end. Often the season of suffering will start before we realize it. But we know. Oh, yeah, baby, we know when the season ends. But it's a season. It means it's beginning and end. So whatever the thing is that we're going through, whatever is hurtful or painful, whatever experience we're going through, it ain't going to last forever. So we can have faith in the fact that that's going to happen. And when it's over, God's going to do four things. Four, four, four things. He's going to do four things. He's going to perfect us which means to complete us. He's going to establish us, which means to settle us on firm ground. He's going to strengthen. Well, he's going to strengthen us. He's going to settle us. And then it ends, instead of Satan having his dominion over us, to God be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's a beautiful passage in 1 Peter 5. That's in my head all the time. Now, we just saw James. I'll go back to what James quoted before. I mean, let me paste that. Because we went on a pretty good detour there. 
He says, above all, in verse 12, that was our starting verse for tonight. And boy, we got some mileage out of that, haven't we? Um, that's true, Marion. It's a fact, but it's out there for everybody. He's relentless. He knows he's on a timeline. He knows he's only got so long to do this, so he's pushing, 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 pushing. And, and most of the people don't think. They're just bouncing around. I know when I was lost, I had no idea how much control Satan had over my soul. I thought I was my own man. Wrong. And then I, I can't believe I was that wrong. I couldn't, I believe now. Uh, James um, 5.12 says that. It says, um, let your yeses be yeses. Don't swear either. And then he moves on to his next comment in 13. Let me scroll down to that. It's like a gear shift. He says, and he's, you know, he's writing this letter and he's thinking about what else should I say before I end it? Is anything, anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. You know, psalms, which is music, is psalms put to me, it's songs, word songs, put to musical instruments. God never said to not do that. Uh, so we're going to keep doing that. Um, the word suffering in that verse means to be afflicted or suffering anything bad because of evil. And like, unlike, um, like Marion puts it, there's so much temptation out there. Let, let me quote how the Amplified Bible quotes that verse. Sometimes it sheds some light on these things. Is anyone among you afflicted, ill-treated, suffering evil? He should pray. Is anyone glad at heart? He should, should sing praise to the Lord. Pray and hold on to teaching them when they're young. They come back to the fold. That's true. There's a scripture about that. Um, raise your children in the way you want them to go. And when, 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 and, and, then, and when they're older, they will come back to it. Sometimes they drift off for a little bit. Um, so I had, I had a, a guy who watched over my soul. He was my pastor. Uh, he functioned apostolically in the body of Christ, but he, he functioned as shepherd to me. And, and uh, he would come to our house, and I would give him the floor. And so when we had, when we had uh, our gatherings, our house church meetings, I would say, Don's going to carry the meeting. He's going to administrate the meeting. And so often people would come to him and say, could you pray for me? Thinking that because he was my pastor, uh, somehow he was elevated. I, I, I've said this a million times. There are no elevated positions in the body of Christ. There are a bunch of people that erect those. But the scripture doesn't teach that concept. Because And so if anybody erects that, and acts like they need a special car, a special chair, a special entourage, or anything like that. They're, they're uh, practicing a lie. But uh, Don was very humble, and and um, and neither of us thought we were elevated. But people are used to thinking that if you have a title in someone's life, that you somehow got more grace or something. I don't know, but I don't really think that. I believe that each of us has unique prayer. Um, unique uh, gifts and talents and that's God's design and it's his design who you get to meet. Anyway, he was there. There was a purpose for it and people would say, I, I had this, my knee hurts. Can you pray for it? And you know what Don would always do every single time? And it was fun to watch because even if I was across the room not eavesdropping, I knew what he asked and it was fun watching the look on people's face, faces because he would say, before I pray for you, let me ask you, have you prayed for yourself? And the reason he did that was this verse. Are you suffering? Pray. 
And have you noticed that many of us don't lay hands on ourselves and pray for ourselves? I developed a, a pain in the top part of my left foot. I, I think I pulled a tendon. And that caused me to walk funny for about a week and a half. Because of that, my knees, both of which have arthritis, but generally don't hurt, uh, began to hurt, my left knee in particular. And so I was sitting alone. Laurie was asleep. I was at my desk writing. And I looked down at my knee, and I just laid my hand on it. And this might sound stupid, but James says, if anyone's suffering, pray. Let him pray. And so I asked the Lord to take the pain from my knee, to heal my knee. And my pain went away. If anyone's suffering, let him pray. I find it astounding how f few Christians seem to pray for themselves when things aren't going well. Don was a true leader in the body of Christ. And if you read in Ephesians chapter 4, whatever the, the leadership is, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, um, apostle, prophet, evangelist, um, what are the five? Apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, all five. I'm blanking on the last one. Uh, shingles has affected my thinking. Um, their job is to equip the body of Christ. Don, everything he did when he comes to all the time, really, and I hope everything I do, is equipping. So while he's going to fix and to pray for somebody, he's teaching them the truth. Sm smiling, a gentle smile. Pray. He was a true leader in the body of Christ. He was equipping us. Don, like James, knew the fa our Father in heaven expected to hear from us when we're suffering. And you know what? Sometimes that prayer can be out, or that prayer can be a, an impassioned why. He loves hearing from his children. If there's anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Let him sing songs. If anyone cheerful, let him sing songs. Psalms. In other words, that whatever was happening in here, we should do something about it in the physical. If you're suffering, pray out loud to God. If you're cheerful, Sing a song. You know, let your yeses be yeses with the way we manage our heart. How many, how many people have you experienced in church and you know they're hurting? How many people, when you ask them, have their church face on and say, everything's great? I walked into a local establishment recently and... Um, um, it's a husband and wife and, and some other family members own this place and, and she, she just her face she, was, she had emotional pain I could just see it on her face and she's got reasons for that I said hey are you okay and she goes yeah I'm great I'm just tired it wasn't true her yes wasn't a yes She's putting on a happy face. She's trying to suck it up. She's trying to look okay. But she wasn't okay, and her face showed it. I would have prayed for her right there and blessed her right there. I prayed in my car after. Why? Why do we have to portray ourselves falsely? The word psalming, which literally means, which is what that word is, sing songs really means psalming, a gerund. It's got the I-N-G on it. Literally means to sing 
while plucking an instrument. Well, I, you don't want to hear me do that. Just, I can sing a song. Over time, it applied to anyone who sang to musical accompaniment, but it specifically refers to the those singing praises to their God with or without an instrument. James then was suggesting that when things were bad, we should interact with God by praying for ourselves. And we're going to see in a little bit, probably next week, that this isn't our only recourse for when we are suffering. He was also suggesting that when things were good, we should also interact with God by singing with his praises, not just when things were bad. Met a guy once, and he's in heaven now. His name was Totilla Grandbergs. And that guy, from the moment he got in the car, I think it was in Abilene, we picked him up. And we drove him to Albuquerque for a conference. And he slept in the hotel room with Don and I. And then we drove him back to Abilene. For five days or four days or whatever it was, he sang all the time. The dude was overpouring with joy. And he loved the Lord. He had a smile on his face. He was that guy that his mom probably told him, wipe that smile off your face. He could never get it off his face. He was just full of the joy of the Lord. And I instantly loved this guy. He was great. He was singing to God because he was happy. In contrast to our current religious thoughts on prayer and praise, first century believers didn't only pray when they wanted God to be their EMT and didn't just praise him when someone on the stage told them, now is it's time to worship. Prayer and praise were for all the time. And guess what? It still is. On the subject of singing psalms, I thought it best to mention something out of Ephesians chapter um, 5. Let me copy this. Paul said, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Dissipation means that it just wastes us or fritters away the power that you have. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks, always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. It was normal for first century believers to sing in various ways when they met in, another, in one another's homes to worship the Lord. And when they met at the marketplace, and in the beginning, I guess, when they met at the temple before they were booted out of there. Some sang with or without musical instruments. There is no place in the scriptures which instructs us to abandon instruments in worship. I bring this up because there are several of the countless splinters of the church which insist that musical instruments were for old covenant worship and are equally valid according um, uh, old, uh, old covenant worship. And while a cappella worship, which is singing without instruments, can be beautiful. And I've sang, I've been in some places where it just brought goosebumps on your goosebumps. Other forms of new covenant worship are equally valid, according to the Bible. If you have a guitar and you can play it, then play it and sing songs to the Lord. If you can't, like me, play a CD or just sing, you know, and, and enjoy the Lord. And when you're not in a singing place, when, you, when your uh, soul is tired and, and, you, um, and you're hurting, then don't feel pressure to do it just because somebody said to do it. Be real. How's that for a weird, a weird concept? Let your yeses be yeses. Let your noes be noes. This is where we're going to stop for now. Right now, um, I'm going to, um, we're going to pray. Right now, 
Marion and Yala, if you give me a second, um, I'm sending myself an email with this prayer request. And when I get home, it'll be on my computer, Marion, and I will send that out to all over the place. Um, and if you ever want to be on that mailing list, then just um, say so in a private message. Never give, never give your um, email address on open chat room like this. So right now, what we're going to do is we're going to pray for uh, Marion's brother-in-law, William, who goes by Bobby. And I'm just going to pray for him that way. Father God, Bobby has liver cancer. I don't know him, but you do. You know what he's all about. I ask you to guide the surgeon's hands. I ask you to give him a good night's sleep um, tonight and tomorrow night. So when he goes in for surgery, he's well rested. I pray the same thing for everybody from the nurses that deal with him, to the people that wheel him down, to the operating room, to the surgeons, to the anesthesiologist, to anybody that touches anything that has to do with Bobby, that you um, give them good night's rest, clear their minds, have them focus on what they're doing, and that when they finish, uh, he gets a good prognosis. I ask you to bless him and all who love him. We also ask you to uh, control his uh, the pain associated with the cancer, it's not his cancer. It's cancer that is in his body. And that, I don't believe, is your will. I ask you to heal him. I ask you to give him post-surgical peace. And that um, the anesthesiology, anesthesi, uh, what is that, anesthesia, doesn't uh, have bad effects on him. And that he comes out of it fine. And that uh, he does well. And that all his, his family is blessed in this. And I ask you to make divine appointments for him while he's there. And I thank you for that. I thank you for a sister-in-law who um, is willing to pray for William, Bobby, um, and send out a prayer request. So we thank you for that. I thank you for the study, Father. I thank you that you taught, remind us in James to pray for ourselves. I thank you that you remind us to rejoice when it's time to rejoice. I ask you. Thank you for reminding us that any trial we have is temporary, that you've thought about it, and that in the long run, something beneficial will come out of it, and that um, when we're done, you will perfect us, establish us, and, um, and do those other things you promised. So I thank you for that. I ask you to bless those who are here for the study. I ask you to bless those who wish they were here. I ask you to bless those who listen to it or see it on other media later. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the idea that uh, Donna gave. And I'm going to investigate trying to do these things as a Zoom thing and see how that works. We thank you for this, Father, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So remember, I'm typing in a website. Um, If you want to look up other videos that we've done, you can go there, bring you to a button on the website. Um, if, you're, um, if you like to read, and if you like the way I teach, then go to that website, and you can, there's 260 articles there, and I may be adding some soon. I can feel an upswelling of that. Um, God bless you guys. I love you. Hey, Jacob, glad you could make it. We're right at the end. I don't know how long you've been here. Um, but um, um, maybe we'll see you next time. God bless y'all. I'll see you next time. I love you guys. Thank you for doing this. It really means a lot that you'll take part in this Bible study every week. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.